There should be a better coordination between the United Nations Central Organization and things like the UNDP and its organs and the World Bank and the IMF which had drifted way apart from the original intention which was to work in coordination with the United Nations rather than be totally independent, rather arrogant, looking down the nose at what these people did up in New York while we ran the world essentially uh, through our big money pockets. Uh, I just hope that in five to ten years time the, we will have, be at the, we're at the bottom end of a political leadership trough at the moment. I'm hoping it will, it will come up and we will get political leadership. But we need international structures of far greater power and authority and respect. To that I have a pretty straightforward answer. It depends on whether Donald Trump is re-elected as US President next year or not. In a document called The First Global Revolution, authored by Alexander King and Bertrand Schneider, on pages 104 and 105, it stated, In searching for a new enemy to unite us, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine and the like would fit the bill. All these dangers, of course, will be caused by human intervention that will require a global response. That's the origin of global warming, ladies and gentlemen. Peter, what are we um, seeing on this wall? Well, you're seeing the history of much of the last uh, 60 years in terms of uh, technology and ideas that have had a huge impact in the world. Uh, Jay Forrester passed away last fall, and uh, about three weeks ago, we had a celebration here of his life. Uh, so this goes from the 1940s, 30s, in his early you know, life, 40s, he was actually if anything, if anybody could be called the inventor of the modern digital computer, Jay would be it. He led the team at MIT that built the first general purpose digital computer. That's the stuff you see over here. How IBM got involved. IBM was their contractor. Uh, that's how IBM got into computation, into digital computers. Compu computers. <laughs> It's not some science fantasy effect from 2001. This electronic display emanating from Australia's largest computer is a picture of the condition past, present and future of planet Earth. The program was originally devised by a scientist working from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Jay Forrester. It was developed under the auspices of the Club of Rome by an MIT research team to present a complex model of the world and what we humans are doing to it. The program, called World One, doesn't pretend to be a precise forecast. What it does for the first time in man's history on the planet is to look at the world as one system. It shows that Earth cannot sustain present population and industrial growth for much more than a few decades. It shows that simply cleaning up our car exhausts and making some small effort to limit our families simply isn't enough. It's like an electronic guided tour of our global behavior since 1900 and where that behavior will lead us. Well, this is the printed version of what we've just seen on the television screen. And what looks at first to be just a maze of computer characteristics is really a system of very simple graphs which project what's going to happen to the planet over the next 150 years if we don't do something drastic to stop it. Down the left-hand side of the graph is the date, 1900, 1940, 1980, 2020, right down to 2060. Now, each of these lines of, of, of letters represents a curve showing some aspect of the condition of the planet. The further out this way they go, the greater that figure is, the further this way, uh, the less. For example, P represents population. So here it is at 1900 and then it comes up to 1940, it starts to take off. Here we are at 1980, up to the turn of the century, and then it starts to peter off. Let's now have a look at this next curve, the Q curve, which is the quality of life. And this is represented by, for example, the amount of space people have, the uh, amount of money they have to spend, the amount of food they have to eat. Now, it increases rapidly up to 1940, but from 1940 on, 
the quality of life diminishes. And here we are about the turn of the century and we come up to the year 2020 and it's really come right back. More people, of course, means that you start to chew up your supply of natural resources. And this is this curve here, the N curve, that shows that slowly but steadily, the pool of natural wealth in the world, natural resources, minerals, oil and so on, is slowly but steadily diminishing. So this is the situation. As population increases, the quality of life decreases, and the supply of natural resources decreases. But have a look at this curve here. This is called the Z curve, and it represents pop uh, pollution. Now, predictably enough, as the population increases up to 1980, pollution increases. There's more rubbish. But from 1980 to the year 2020, pollution really takes off. This is assuming, of course, that we don't do anything about it. So the year 2020, the condition of the planet be starts to become highly critical. And if we don't do anything about it, this is what's going to happen. The quality of life is going to go right back to practically zero. Pollution is going to become so serious, right out here, that it will start to kill people. So the population will diminish. Right back here, less than it was in the year 1900. And at this stage, round about the year 2040, 2050, civilized life as we know it on this planet will cease to exist. Well, hopefully, of course, it won't be allowed to happen. But it's taken this kind of shock treatment to nudge governments into doing something. So uh, one of the kind of milestones captured in Kelvey's wall here is a book called World Dynamics, which led to another book, the popularized version, called The Limits to Growth. It was the first complete model of the global industrialization process, how economic growth interacts with all the environmental and social constraints. So today, virtually all the issues we talk about in the general heading of sustainability were foreshadowed. I came back to MIT, walked into the office on Monday, and it was announced that a group I never heard about before, the Club of Rome, would be coming to MIT to learn about our computer modeling methods because they were interested in doing some kind of global study. In 1972, Dennis Meadows was the first to be assigned with such future studies, financed by Volkswagen Foundation. Then I put together a team of 16 people, and we worked for uh, almost two years and produced the work. Limits to Growth was not the goal of the project. The goal was a very big scientific report, and Limits was written uh, as an afterthought. What we said is that exponential growth will take us to the limits very soon. Actually, if you look at our book, our 1972 book, although we showed many different scenarios, all of them show that growth stops sometime in the period of 2020 to, let's say, 2060. So, soon. This little sketch here is the first uh, world dynamics model that Jay sketched out s sitting in an airplane seat flying back from Germany where the Volkswagen Foundation had hosted the first gathering of what became the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome, which still exists, was the sponsor of the Limits to Growth project. Jay sketched out the model, the systematics model, the airplane flight back, and about two or three months later he had a simulated model, and about two or three months after that, a book. That was kind of midway in Jay's career, and the, the right half of this really chases out the second half, the last 40 years. Jay lived to be 98 years old, uh, where a lot of us got involved. So a lot of these sustainability issues, the seeds were planted back here with the limits to growth. But then on the right side of the wall, you see the work on climate change, you see the work on, uh, on education. Uh, we'll talk maybe a little later about the Global Sustainable Food Laboratory. This whole unfolding that kind of occurred as a consequence of the kind of seeds Jay had planted. It's, it's quite remarkable. Scam. Um, I mentioned earlier an organization uh, called uh, the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome was started in 1968. And it's part of a network of organizations. 
The Club of Rome has been described as a crisis think tank, which specialises in crisis creation. The main purpose of this think tank was to formulate a crisis that would unite the world and condition us to the idea of global solutions to local problems. Think tanks, this is what they are. This is what they are. Watch the think tanks. Big time. Big time. You know, again, it's easy to criticize, but if you think we're, we're, we're trying to invent something that's never existed, which is, you might say, a common space, socially oriented and sensitive governance structures that can function globally as well as locally, and how to create a new harmonious ecosystem between the local and the global. You disturb the system over the threshold of the so-called tipping points. At the end of the century, we will have about two billion people living on Earth. Food production is, of course, what we're really going to suffer from. Rather than nine billion, which is the usual number used in demographics around the world. We will lose soil, erosion, desertification, and we won't have the phosphate to feed nine billion people. So it will be far less. Far less. More than 11,000 scientists signed a petition calling for population control as a means of combating climate change. In an article published Tuesday in the journal Bioscience, the scientists wrote that planet Earth is, quote, facing a climate emergency. They argued that population control was a necessary response to this emergency, writing, quote, the world population must be stabilized and ideally gradually reduced. This ideology is dangerous because it suggests that reducing the human population is the best solution to our problems. But the petition presents no facts or data to support its claim that the human population is the cause of shrinking ice caps, rising ocean levels, and an increase in the average global surface temperature. And it doesn't show any data to prove that reducing human population could help the planet. That's just bad science. And who gets to decide which populations are controlled? The UN? Individual countries? Global intellectual elites? Elite? The myth of overpopulation originated in England in 1798, when a vicar named Thomas Malthus, who fancied himself something of a mathematician, saw that food production increased incrementally, but people reproduced exponentially. He sat down and did some simple math, and summarily decided that the world would be out of food by 1890. He blamed reduced mortality rates, and recommended killing off the have-nots of society, lest the haves starve to death. This cry was taken up by Paul Ehrlich of Stanford University in 1968, who claimed that reckless human reproduction had overwhelmed the Earth. Massive famines would result, which would destroy, best case scenario, one-fifth of humanity by the end of the 70s. And the planet would follow. This fear produced large donations for the newly created UNFPA, which thrives on an imagined crisis that has been both imminent and rescheduled again and again over the past two centuries. The truth of the matter is that every family on this planet could have a house with a yard and all live together on a landmass the size of Texas, which is really just a small corner of the planet. The population of Earth will peak in 30 years and then start to go back down. We're not overpopulated. Do the math. For years, there's been a push to shove birth control and abortion down the throats of women in developing countries who don't want either, by the way. We don't get to pick who is desirable or useful enough to reproduce and who should be restricted in the name of the global common good. That's called eugenics and it can lead down a slippery slope to things like ethnic cleansing and genocide. Genocide. This is the new hockey stick and the skyrocketing of the purple line tells us that the parallelity between CO2 concentration and temperature is an automatism. How did we get to focus on CO2 as being this tipping point, the, the culprit? Because it's something we do ourselves and th that's what makes it special. It's, it is human activity. The fact is that CO2 is so beneficial in other ways. It would be crazy to try t to reduce it. We have to develop a completely different energy system around the world. We have to get rid of carbon as soon as possible. And the challenge is to invest, to research and to develop and to educate the world in that direction. Direction. Global warming is merely the latest environmental scare with the exact same solutions going back 50 years. 
In other words, it doesn't really matter what the science of global warming. They actually have quotes. Their main figures say that. The EU climate commissioner said, even if we're wrong on the science, we're doing the right thing by policy. What is that policy? The UN climate chief explicitly stated, and I interviewed her on this, we seek a centralized transformation that will make life on planet Earth very different for everyone. That's the UN climate chief's explicit goal. Her assistant, a guy named Edenhofer, actually said, we will redistribute wealth by climate policy. This is not even about environmental policy anymore. They're openly talking about it. They talk about global governance, global governance. We gradually grow in understanding. Mark my words, we do. But of course, the resistance also grows. And there is a very strange phenomenon, which is that for every so-called scientific fact, we need another opinion. Why do we need that? Because the media demands so. Demand. We've got to remember, we have to be faithful as scientists. In a lot of cases, people have written that it's okay that the end justifies the means. We can make up these scary scenarios so people will listen to us, people will act. I don't think that's moral. I think we have to tell the truth as scientists. If you want to be an activist, take off your scientist hat, then make, make a statement as a public ser servant. That's no problem at all. But you cannot divorce the, the truth from the debate. That is the important component. But we should be arguing about the right things, not is there or is there not climate change. Is what's the deliberate impact of this change or this change or this change, knowing that we need to decarbonize our economies and that we're a sense of working on it together around the world. I think this particular decade, the one critical thing that I feel could really happen is we start to feel we're in it together. We have 12 years to radically transform our economy and our society to stop this crisis and protect human civilization as we know it. This is about Humanity. That's why we demand a new Green Deal, and we demand it right now. People will vote if there is something worth voting for. And a Green New Deal is exactly what that is. Thank you all so much. Let's organize together. Don't settle for less. They don't want to argue on the merits of their policies. In other words, the Green New Deal they just admitted AOC's chief of staff said this was never about the climate. This was a, uh, a, a increase the government kind of thing, a change the whole economy type of thing. Her uh, former chief of staff, uh, campaign manager, actually said a similar thing, that this was actually not about the climate. They're openly admitting that. They don't want to argue their points on the merit. Instead, so they use subdiffuse. We only have 12 years left. We're facing a climate emergency as cities and colleges are now comically declaring that across the, the world. Uh, so they don't, have to, they don't have to deal with that. That's how global warming becomes part of the agenda tool for the regulatory state. Um, they've introduced through the Democratic Party and a lady called um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who's kind of the, the progressive poster girl at the moment, um, uh, something called the Green New Deal. And the Green New Deal is basically what I'm talking about. It's the centralization of power to save the world. Now, once you centralize power, and this is what Marxism does, this is what fascism does, which are basically expressions of the same thing if we, if we really look at them. Once you centralize power, you are creating a very simple situation. You are giving control over the vast majority to a tiny few. And you are um, hoping that they're benevolent, you're hoping that they will use that power um, wisely. Mm -hmm. History tells us they never do. Once you have centralization of power, you have abuse of power. And what we've um, been looking at through uh, human history is the incessant centralization of power. We were in tribes once, loads of tribes were brought together under nations. Now they're bringing loads of nations together under the European Union. And, and, and now they, they're talking about uh, wanting a world government, which is what I predicted they would want 30 years ago. Um, and we're in a situation now where a globalization is the, the total expression of what I'm talking about, where the, the, the number of people who hold the real center of power in the world, never mind Britain, is tiny. It's tiny. Assuming we actually face the climate emergency, we would all be doomed if we had to rely on the EPA and the United Nations uh, or the Green New Deal to save us. 
So it's a way to transform the economy, massive wealth redistribution, massive central planning, with literally beam counters affecting every aspect of your life, of your life. And this is the result, Madam Acting Deputy President, of federal agreements with UN treaties, protocols, declarations, agreements, such as the 1975 Lima Declaration. And then we had in 1992, the UN's Rio Declaration for 21st Century Global Governance. Then we had the 1996 UN Kyoto Agreement, which I've discussed, which led to the theft of property rights. Then we have the 2015 UN Paris Agreement. That was not an agreement, just an agreement for every nation to do what they wanted to do. This is a massive movement, and its real intentions are being masked with environmental issues. The bad news is, this structure was set up by those who want to establish a global government system. They've set this stru structure up years ago. This is why I keep saying to you, you don't have any idea how far behind we really are. Far behind. In, um, far... Towards the end of the uh, 19th century, early 20th century, secret society was created in Britain called the Round Table. The first head of it was Cecil Rhodes, who was a Rothschild agent. That's why he went into s Southern Africa and pillaged the, um, the, the uh, gold and diamond resources and destroyed that, that society on behalf of the Rothschilds. And he was the head of the Round Table. Then when, when he died, uh, another guy called um, Alfred Milner took over, another Rothschild agent. And um, they start, this secret society started spawning satellite organizations. First one they, they created was um, uh, the Royal Institute of International Affairs in London, also known as Chatham House. Um, and then they created something in America, which was a, a, an American version of that, called the Council on Foreign Relations. Council on Foreign Relations has, to a very large extent, driven American foreign policy ever since to this day. Then came... Um, the Bilderberg Group in 1954, um, for, uh, uh, formed at the Bilderberg Hotel in Oosterbeek, Holland. Um, then in 1968 came the Club of Rome, and then came the Trilateral Commission in 72-73. Now the Club of Rome was created specifically to use the environment as an excuse to transform society. And um, I've been writing about this for a long time. And basically, you say, to save the planet, this has to happen. And to save the planet, it's a planet, it's a globe, therefore, we have to have global centralization of power to, centra to, to, control, uh, to save the planet. Yeah, I think the, the, the first real awakening is, is like what we always say when people play the, the, uh, the climate simulation. The, uh, the Sea Roads uh, Climate Interactive Simulation. If you, really, if you really watch how that works, you come to one overarching conclusion. One, we gotta get going, and however fast we're going, we gotta go faster. Faster, faster. But two, it's about everybody. You know, it is ultimately about the underdeveloped world, because if they stay on the same path as the developed world, in 30 years, they start to become significant emitters. Morality is improving the lives of people. That means inexpensive and ready access to food, to energy. From that perspective, the policies proposed are the essence of immorality. And I find it uh, truly bizarre. Here's somebody who's distorting science, following the path of fascists in the past who is proposing policies that will be harmful for millions of people. And he assumes he has the moral high ground and the people who are opposing this don't seem to recognize they hold the moral high ground. I predict, this is my sincere prediction, that 10 years from now, certainly 20 years from now, people will look back on this and they'll say, what the hell was going on? What got into these people? Why did the world turn crazy about global warming? It's a non-problem. It's fiction. And so the Club of Rome has been one of the big drivers of human-caused climate change, or the illusion of it. And then um, came a United Nations agenda called Agenda 
uh, uh, Agenda 21. Um, and that laid out a um, strategy for transforming society to meet the challenge of climate change. It was everything that they wanted. They wanted. Environmental groups have effectively created a public image as organizations caring for helpless species and protecting environments. This has allowed them to implement an agenda in America that if fully exposed would be opposed by the majority of the people. In fact, most people supporting these organizations are not aware of their long-term objective, even though it is no secret. I'd now like to quote from the UN Agenda 21 book that is driving this. Maurice Strong, the Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, he said, quote, in the preface, in the foreword to this, this instruction, there is much to be done. And I look to the new United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development to be the focal point for the massive effort needed to create the new era of international cooperation for the new global partnership that will make this shift possible. So we're talking here about a global governance from the UN. Agenda 21 stands as a comprehensive, this is the UN's words, Agenda 21 stands as a comprehensive blueprint for action to be taken globally from now into the 21st century by governments, United Nations organizations, development agencies, non-governmental organizations and independent sector groups in every area in which human activity impacts on the environment. And that means every area of human livelihood, human existence. The agenda, it goes on to say, the agenda should be studied in conjunction with both the Rio Declaration, which provides a context for its specific proposals, and the Statement of Forest Principles, which is embraced by the UN. It is hoped that the Forest Principles will form the basis for a future international level agreement. The United Nations and Morris Strong, who was the head of that entity at that time, that particular part of the UN, has admitted to pushing for an unelected socialist global governance. In September 2015, all 193 UN member states adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They recognized that ending poverty calls for transforming our world through strategies that build economic growth, address social needs, and ensure environmental protection. To achieve this vision, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, known as SDGs, were defined as part of the 2030 Agenda. The SDGs and their targets balance the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social and environmental, working in partnerships and calling for action by all countries. The goals are integrated and indivisible. recently they've uh, advanced that and they call it now Agenda 2030 um, which is a, 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 a an updated version of the same thing and when you read Agenda 2030 it is um, a tyranny's um, dream because it dictates every area of human life including education to save the planet and this is problem, reaction, solution, as I call it. And this has been um, uh, worked towards for a long time. The plan to transform human society into a centralized dictatorship on the justification of we have to do this to save the planet. Take a look, take a look at the Wildlands map. It defines where environmentalists want to take America in the very near future. The areas in red will be off-limits to humans. The areas in yellow represent buffer zones, where limited use is allowed primarily to travel to and from populated areas. The areas in green are where normal use by humans will be allowed. However, by the environmentalists' own admission, these normal use areas would be restricted. When this plan was first published in 1992, the author, Reed Noss, explained how their agenda would affect the human population. He stated, 
Eventually, a wilderness network would dominate a region and thus would itself constitute the matrix, with human habitations being the islands. The islands. At European level, landowners' interests are represented in Brussels by the European Landowners' Organization. Restoring biodiversity is one of the group's concerns. The ELO has become involved in Nature 2000 because it represents one of the most essential aspects of the life of rural landowners, who have always developed and respected the quality of the environment. Even if Nature 2000 can be a constraint, it offers many opportunities and that is what we try to highlight and develop by participating with civil society, NGOs and political leaders in the development of a sustainable network acceptable to all the partners. Preserving or restoring biodiversity and the ecosystem in different habitats, from the countryside to mountains to the marine environment. That is the main objective of the European Natura 2000 network. I think it's fair to say that uh, if uh, Natura 2000 uh, didn't exist, uh, in fact I'm definite of this, I would not be sitting here now. And uh, the reason why I say that is because uh, I got involved in European politics because we had a situation in Ireland whereby we had a top-down decision imposed on us without any consultation. That's the way we seen it on the ground. And the first time many of my neighbours heard of Natura 2000 was when the police were threatening to arrest them for taking fuel from their bogs. Now, some people mightn't think that's the best way to get fuel for your house, but we had done it for hundreds of years. You can argue whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but we were doing it, and that's the way we heated our house. And I would now be speaking with an English or a London accent if it wasn't for that method of producing fuel, because my father, in some people's eyes, would be the ultimate sinner. He brought it home for people. So you can imagine our shock and horror when we discovered that we would potentially face a half a million euro fine and up to five years in prison, longer than in many cases you get for rape in my country, for doing something we had done for centuries. We can argue whether it's wrong or right, but that's not what I'm arguing. I'm having a discussion here or trying to tease out how this would work better. And I tell you for definite, it would have worked better if people had been consulted with in advance and they were not consulted. And it resulted in a situation, and hopefully people can learn from this, where we had hundreds and hundreds of people in a bog one night with members of our police force, with machine guns, with assault rifles, attempting to stop people using their land. Whether they're right or wrong to use it, we can have that debate, but I think we would have to conclude that the implementation didn't go too well. Seizing private property, private property. You may have heard of eminent domain, whereby the government, federal, state, or local, can seize private property if there is a need for the public good, they say. Now, the government has to pay for it, but they can take it away from its rightful owner if the rightful owner won't sell. This ordinance is the biggest threat our 100-year-old family farm has ever faced. It imposes unnecessary regulations on our land that will mandate a conservation easement with no compensation. The precedent that this sets is that the government can come in and take away private land with zero compensation. It's un-American. It's un-American. The abolition of private property. We see that beginning to happen right now. Roads are being closed, um, forests are being more limited, and the idea here is that you stack and pack people in metropolitan areas, you put them on public transportation, and you never let them outside. So the wildlands gets protected in that fashion. This is why the pressure is mounting on landowners across America. Soon that battle is going to shift into suburban neighborhoods and the battle for the resettlement of our suburban neighbors, neighborhoods will begin. Agenda 21 will not stop its process until all the world is collectivized. Human beings are to be congregated in smart growth communities. That's why you see in 
every community in California and across the country. The push for walkable communities, which means you live on the 20th floor and you walk downstairs. Where smart growth cages are really built for the American citizens. And we thought the one way in and one way out of Polish cities was a dangerous mistake. Well, smart growth is designed to take control over all human action. Now, a subset of the Wildlands Project allows for certain limited uses by certain special people, not to include the general public. But in general, the Wildlands, as opposed to the smart growth proposals, which have to do with metropolitan development, the Wildlands Project is, is the idea to suck all the people into these metropolitan areas and to leave the wildlands free for the animals to roam. South San Jose is a good example of what's become, or is becoming a wildlands project. South San Jose is called the Coyote Valley. And gee, some coyotes like to cross that valley and some other animals as well. And so that's off limits to development. And we're seeing that kind of activity happening everywhere across this country. And um, it's only gonna get a lot more profound as time moves along. Wildlands Project is a massive undertaking. Take rural lands and put it off limits to human beings. World government is the program behind the Democrat Party and Republican Party sponsored Agenda 21 program. Your local politicians are, are, are paid uh, by parties who support the globalization, including the destruction of America. Because the programs of sustainable development have been in, in process for a lot longer than simply since 1992. But the acceleration since then has been overwhelming. Anybody here heard about Agenda 21? Well, some. You need to all know about it. It's a, it's a code phrase. It's the title of the program for collectivism, global pro, uh, collectivism, which was designed at the United Nations and is being implemented as we speak in every country of the world, at least where the UN has an interest in implementing it, in the more advanced nations. And it's being done under the guise of environmentalism. They're using the label of, let's be concerned about our planet Earth. Our planet Earth is, is being destroyed. We're losing our natural resources. Uh, everything is going bad in, in the environment. We've got global warming. We've got all these things. We've got pollution. So therefore, what we need is more laws surprise more laws and especially at the international level to regulate and control these things and take away the personal freedoms that you and I have over our own property because we need to do it for the greater good of the greater number we need to do it to save the world and it's being coordinated at the United Nations no one not even the longtime opponents of the environmental movement believe such a transforming agenda was possible. However, it is being implemented quickly through innocent sounding programs that most Americans support. Wilderness areas, critical habitat for endangered species, wetlands, roadless areas, national heritage areas, and other restrictive programs are sold to the public as necessary to protect nature or as assurance that Americans will always have a place to escape from the heavily populated cities. More inventive tools and programs, such as conservation easements, smart growth, open space, and green lining, are being promoted as a way to control growth. What all these programs have in common is extinguishing the private property rights of American citizens and transferring the control of the property to elite land trusts or directly to the government. It will not take the 80 to 100 years they originally projected to complete their task. They are much closer to achieving their goal than anyone realizes. Environmentalists have scared Americans into thinking that if we continue to live as we are today, the earth will self-destruct, species will die, and the globe will be covered with development. However, government data shows that only 6% of America's land mass is currently developed. Only 3% of America is classified as urban, yet 77% of all Americans live in these urban areas. The rest is still largely untouched by humans. The problem is not that our nation is being overdeveloped. The problem is as old as time, 
it is about who will own the land. Large amounts of the nation's natural resources are still owned by private citizens. America's founders vehemently opposed the concept of government or elitists owning the land in America, which would result in the citizens being leaseholders and serfs. One of the most well-known property rights advocate of our time, Wayne Hage, said it best. Either you have the right to own property, or you are property. Make no mistake, this battle is not about whether the land will be used, resources extracted, and wealth created, but by whom. Karl Marx wrote in the Communist Manifesto, the theory of the communist may be summed up in the single sentence, abolition of private property. America's founding father, John Adams, stated, property must be secured or liberty cannot exist. Which course will America take? Environmentalists are counting on their agenda never being fully revealed. Taking liberty is committed to seeing that it is. Their plan must be stopped before all of our liberty is taken. Thank you.